Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos, and in this video I'm going to talk about my predictions and expectations for how different systems in Shadowlands are going to play out, which ones are going to be good, which ones are going to be bad, and how good and how bad I think each of them are going to be. The reason I'm making this video now is that we now have a release date for Shadowlands. It is two months away, it is October 27th, uh, that the expansion is going to be coming out. Now there's a lot of people on Twitter, for example, that are saying, oh, it's too early, you know, it's too soon for Shadowlands to come out, fix all these problems first. I personally don't subscribe to that philosophy. I think that, for me, the things that are going to be on the, uh, on the bad side of this video are not things that need more developer time to fix. They are things that need, you know, philosophy change to, to fix. So uh, I don't think that a release date is something that will come... Like, pushing the release date back, I don't think, fixes any of the things that I have problems with. And all the other stuff, I think, is in a pretty good shape from what's looking, what it looks like on beta and is ready to come out in two months. So, without further ado, let me explain a little bit about how this video is structured, because I'm sure you're looking at all this and you're like, what is going on here? Well, on my last video, I got a couple of comments. One was, why are you using paint? Use Excel or something instead. So I've decided to make this video one where paint is a little bit more uh, explainable, a little bit, a little bit more justifiable. So this is my... Uh, this is the space where all the all the new features are going to be. Good stuff is going to be above this line, and bad stuff is going to be below this line. Uh, and how far above or below this line something is, is the better or worse I think it is, right? So like up here is like the super duper epic space, right? And then this is like very cool. And then here is like nice, right? But then if we get to the other side, if we go down here, then we have like eh, I guess I'll live with it, right? Like a little bit bad, not a big deal though. And then this is like the pretty cringe tier for stuff that's like, you know, it is pretty cringe. And then you get down here, it's like, ah, dude, why? This is like where stuff for is really bad, right? So this is the scale for where the different things can be uh, going into Shadowlands. And another thing that I got in my last video was people wanted a dark mode. So I've used the Microsoft Paint tool of the, the paint bucket to change the whole background here to a slightly more uh, it's not it's not just you know super blazing white so if you're if you're a dark mode user hopefully this is a little bit more palatable to you uh, so those are those have been the two main pieces of feedback i received on that uh, my video about conduits or covenants anyways let's get started let's go let's go through some stuff here so uh first new shadowlands feature i'll start with kind of the obvious stuff that every expansion gets we've got some new zones the new zones are fantastic. They're great to look at. They're fun to play through. Uh, they are mostly well designed. There's the Maw is kind of a new end game only zone, uh, sort of reminiscent of like Suramar or Argus and the Broken Shore that came out in patches in Legion. Uh, BFA, it's kind it's kind of like Najatar Mechagon uh, ish, but. It's coming out on release, right? Most of the systems I, or most of the zones I just listed came out during patches. The Maw is going to be here on release and you're going to need to quest through it on release. And you can't mount in there. It's a pretty hostile zone. It can definitely be pretty frustrating to play through there. I understand why they want to have these zones that are like, oh, you can't mount here. You know, we want, we want the zone to feel more impactful. Uh, I personally, I think I'd rather have it be a little bit less annoying than it is, but it, it, I don't think it's a big deal. For the most part, the new zones I think are great. Uh, so we'll put them up pretty high here, maybe slightly below Super Duper Epic, but pretty, pretty great. New zones. All right, the next thing we've got, new raids, of course, are coming out. Every expansion, we got new raids. We don't know what any of the raids are going to be except for uh, the first one, which is Castle Nathria. I've done a lot of Castle Nathria testing, and there are a couple of fights that are a little bit weird. Maybe some of them won't be by the time they come out of beta, but even in beta... Most of the fights I tested were excellent. Uh, the fights aesthetically were great. The zone aesthetically is fantastic. And the mechanics looked fun. There's a little bit of a incentivization away from melee and towards particularly ranged multi-daughters uh, for high-end rating. That's not anything new. It's kind of to be expected. Honestly, at this point, I would say the default for most raid tiers is that it's going to be melee unfriendly and multi-daughter friendly. Uh, and it's it's kind of a, an exception if the tier isn't like that. Uh, but this tier, it looks like it's going to be particularly like that. Uh, that being said, still a fantastic... That doesn't detract from the raid for me. Uh, because that's, you know, a high-end 
only problem, right? We're used to just playing multi daughters, playing a lot of them, not playing a lot of melee. I do think that uh, kind of a long term problem that would be really cool if they could solve would be figuring out how to make melee a little bit more playable in high end rating. But uh, that doesn't detract for me from the raid. The new raid, at least from what it looks like right now, it's way up here in the super duper epic tier. All right, we got some new dungeons. We've got eight of them compared to previous expansions that have had much more, not much more, but more on release. Um, the dungeons themselves are pretty good. They do have these covenant locked abilities that uh, I think detract from them. And there are a couple of them that are a little bit... So you know that the mechanics like uh, like Toldegore's cannon section or Siege of Brales spotter section, there's a couple of instances of mechanics like that in these dungeons. Uh, particularly like Plaguefall has... Uh, this, this mechanics that are I think are the most egregious. A couple other dungeons have like mechanics that deal damage for you, but actually a lot of them have them in much more interesting ways, I'd say, than the spotter or the cannon. Uh, and enough that I actually think they're positive rather than negative even. Uh, so for the most part, I'd say the new dungeons are pretty good. I'll put them here in, around very cool. So new dungeons. Uh, with I, I would say there's, there's maybe going to be a dungeon or two that falls below this line, but on the whole, uh, advent of new dungeons that look pretty good is a positive thing for the for the new expansion. We've also learned some affixes have changed. Uh, so we've got we've got four new affixes. The main big one is Prideful is going to be the new seasonal affix, and Prideful to me looks incre incredible. It looks like the best seasonal affix. Honestly, they, they've outdone themselves. It, it might be it might be better than Awakened, which I did not think something was going to beat Awakened, and before Awakened came out, I didn't think something was going to beat Reaping. Prideful is basically Reaping but single target instead of AOE. And when you kill the Prideful mob, you get a massive buff that feels awesome. So uh, I I couldn't imagine, like, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a little bit of weird stuff with like, okay, maybe you're going to find some ways to like meld these things off or uh, whatever in, in high-end play and in MDI settings and stuff. And like, yeah, may, maybe Shadow Meld should go now. <laughs> I mean, maybe after Shadow Meld broke four previous seasonal affixes, I guess three, it didn't really break Awakened. It, it was still good in Awakened season, right? But it, it only really broke the other three seasonal affixes. Maybe maybe it's time for that to... I don't know. I mean, like, maybe just ban it from the MDI if, if you don't want to change it on live or something. I, I actually don't know. I don't know what the best answer to it is, but it definitely looks like this is going to be another seasonal affix where Shadow Meld is obscenely good in five Night Elf compositions. But uh, that aside, I still think the new affix, Prideful, looks awesome. The other three new affixes, I haven't actually gotten the test, chance to test too much myself. Um, I'm excited by the prospect of them designing new affixes. I think affixes have been pretty stagnant. You know, when we went from BFA to Shadow, or sorry from, sorry, from Legion to BFA, we didn't really change affixes very much at all. Uh, so I'm excited to see more churn in the affix pool. I think that that's good. Uh, I, also, I think that if there's an affix in there, like I Inspiring is being compared a lot to Emissary of the Tides. If there's an affix in there like that, that is, you know, high upkeep and kind of difficult to play and uh, restricts your play patterns... At least it's not a seasonal affix, right? I think that there's it's okay for affixes to be a little bit like that as long as you don't have to deal with them every week. Uh, as long as it's something that isn't super overtuned and isn't too, too bad. I think there's... A, basically what I think is an affix can still be good even if it would be awful as a seasonal affix. I think that there's, there's a lot of affixes like that that are out there, right? Uh, where it's kind of okay as long as you only have to deal with them a few times. Anyways, all in all, I think that the new affixes and particularly the fact that they are actively designing new affixes is fantastic. I think that's that's really great for Mythic Plus. That's exactly the kind of stuff I want to see. So new affixes. So that's also going pretty high up here. So we got a lot of stuff living up here in the in the really high green area for Shadowlands. A lot of stuff that's really exciting. Next thing I'm going to talk about is the Great Vault. This is a replacement for your weekly box. So instead of getting one item for doing a Mythic Plus dungeon in the previous week and one item for capping your conquest in the previous week, you will instead get a vault and the vault has uh nine different spaces in it actually i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up an image of this so i can explain it while i'm talking all right so here's the great vault right so you have these nine different squares and each of them in order to unlock for the week you need to complete the requisite achievement here right so like three raid bosses will unlock one door here for raid gear seven will unlock this this tier and ten will unlock this one one dungeon will unlock this one then four and then ten 125, 350, and 875 conquests will open all these. Now, uh, let me let me talk a little bit about how I believe this is going to work. Not 100% confirmed, but this is my understanding of how the Great Vault works right now. The item behind each of these doors 
will be based on that kind of content. So it'll be a raid item behind the raid door. And the item level will be based on that number, the best ver the best raid boss you killed, that number best. Man, this is not the best time to see this. But basically, like the 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 third highest item level raid boss you killed, you'll get an item level corresponding to that behind this door. The first best M plus dungeon that you've done that week, or Mythic Dungeon, you'll get an item level corresponding behind this door. And then the fourth best dungeon will be behind this door. And the tenth best dungeon will be behind this door. So if you do one plus ten, five plus fives, and then five mythic zeros, your first best dungeon is a plus ten. So you'll have a plus ten item behind here. Your fifth your fourth best dungeon is a plus five, right? So you'll have a plus five item behind here. And your tenth best dungeon is a mythic zero. So you'll have a mythic zero item behind here. So there's not actually a huge incentive to grind a bunch of M0s here. There's incentive, if you can, to do 10 dungeons at the highest level you can do each week if you want to get all the way through here. But once you've done, you know, four dungeons at the highest level you can do each week, call it plus 10 if, if that's you, uh, or, you know, whatever level, there isn't actually much incentive to open up this door. And the reason for that is you don't actually get all nine of these items if you unlock all these squares. You get to pick one item from this whole list. So a lot of people are unhappy about this change for various reasons. Uh... One argument is that, oh, I'm now required to do all of these things, right? Uh, in, in BFA, I only had to do one dungeon and 500 conquest. And in Shadowlands, I'm going to have to do 10 raid bosses, 10 M plus dungeons, and 875 conquest. But I don't actually think that's a fair way of looking at this system. I, I think that this system is actually fantastic. I think that uh, having an option to go deeper in M plus, to just, just do M plus and get a reasonable amount of reward from just doing M plus every week... Uh, and potentially being able to fully gear your character up for M+, plus from M+, plus, uh, eventually, is a great thing for the system to have. And you're so, you know, no matter what you do, you're always going to gear up the fastest by doing all three of these things. That's always going to be true. That's always been true. But this seems like a good way to make it so that if you only do one of these three tracks of content and you specialize in it heavily, you're going to get more rewarded than you were in BFA. And like, yeah, unlocking all nine of these squares is kind of rough. But the thing is that the difference between looking at one item and seven, like picking one item from seven and picking one item from nine is pretty small. The difference between picking one item from five and picking one item from seven, those are pretty small as well. There, there's serious diminishing returns for getting extra boxes in this that I think are going to make it a lot less grindy. You know, people are going to feel obligated to grind uh, this, and certainly people in top guilds will grind it, but it's not an insurmountable difference, right, between the, between getting nine of these squares and between, and between getting seven of these squares. Uh, to the point where I don't think this is going to be a serious problem at all. And again, if you do want all 90 squares, you can do it, right? You can. Uh, it's not that, you know, if you're somebody who plays a lot in the first months of the expansion, I expect, for instance, this is going to be my play pattern, is that until the first raid is on farm, until we've beaten that first boss, I'll be getting all nine of these squares. And then after, the after that boss goes down, I'm going to be getting, like, one of these squares on my main character, maybe more if I also do M plus on my main character. And, you know, also I guess I guess I get these raid ones for free by just doing weekly raid. Uh, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna touch these PvP rewards. Uh, also a cool thing about the system is the item you get behind each door is from that sort of system, right? So if you don't have any good PvP items, you don't need to do PvP. If you want to target farm a PvP item, then you know how to do that, right? You know how to get uh, a good chance of getting whatever PvP item you want is just to keep unlocking all three of your PvP boxes until you get it, and you'll dramatically increase the speed at which you get that, right? Uh, similarly, if there's an item like Gatiku in M+, that you really wanted, you can get more shots at it uh, with this system than you could previously. Still a huge amount of RNG associated with your weekly box. I don't think that's ever going away. Uh, I personally, of course, would, you know, I'd prefer a deterministic way of getting whatever items you wanted and not to have to deal with this RNG, but at this point, I think that Blizzard has clearly identified that their game does better when there's RNG and when you can't deterministically farm everything about your character and i i don't i the, to me this is a great a great middle ground compromise for uh getting everything that everybody wants to some extent so uh great vault i'm gonna call that super duper epic i think that i think that this is uh what a fantastic new system coming with the expansion all right we've got the alt experience in shadowlands from 1 to 50 it's been completely revamped where instead of doing this kind of disjointed thing where you do howling fjord and then you out you've out leveled all of northrend and so you go and do like the Cataclysm zones, and you start doing Mount Hygel, and then you've outleveled all of Cataclysm, and so then you go to do Mop, and you do Jade Forest, and then you've outleveled all of Mop, and you just, you kind of keep doing these, like, first zones, and then you level all the way through that expansion. That was kind of a, 
a, a weird relic of them continually squishing the amount of XP you needed, but still having us need to go through all of these zones. Um, they've done various things to kind of disincentivize that. They've done zone scaling and BFA and stuff to, to disincentivize that kind of weird play pattern. In Shadowlands, I think they've hit an incredible solution for this, where your first character that you level up is just going to do the BFA storyline uh, as their kind of like 1 to 50 experience. And then your other characters that level up are going to do whatever they want. You can pick whatever expansion you want from WoW's history and just do that whole expansion storyline and level from 1 to 50 that way. Uh, this is incredible for me. I think that this is going to be a great way for, you know, if you level up an alt, you get to do something different on it than what you did on your previous character. You can do like eight different characters and they'll all have a different leveling experience, different quest lines and stuff. Uh, or if you have a particular favorite or fastest expansion, you can just do that on all your guys and that's fine too. Uh, there's also a new level 1 to 10 beginner zone that's a modern beginner zone and is not uh, Duratar where you're, you know, killing boars or whatever. So uh, that's a pretty cool new thing as well for, for beginner players. All in all, I think that this experience is going to be great for beginners and it's going to be great for everybody else as well. Uh, so the alt 1 to 50 experience, super duper epic. The alt 51 to 60 experience is also great. The alt 51 to 60 experience is... Uh, Instead of having to just quest through the Shadowland zones, you basically just get to get started on the level 60 progression systems and level up by doing those and by by doing all those things. So uh, also fantastic way of, I'd say, making it so that you, you know, when you start the new expansion content, you actually get to start the real end game content on your alt instead of needing to level it as a separate process from doing the end game stuff. So the alt, 51 to 60 stuff is also very, very good. We'll put that right up here. Man, I'm running out of space here at the top of this. I'm running out of space at the top of my thing. Torghast is up next. Torghast is, uh, it's like the, the horrific vision system kind of taken to, a to its logical extreme. So, uh, you, you climb this tower and every time you do, you get different abilities for your character. It's like a roguelike game. If you've ever played one of those, so something like Slay the Spire or Rogue, um, or FTL, Faster Than Light. Uh, there's there's a lot of games like that that you go through it and it's kind of like a you know you you progress through if you lose you're you're out and you got to start again which Torghast is like that it's forgiving you you don't just die as soon as you you don't you don't fail as soon as you die but if you die enough times on a certain floor uh, you're gonna you're gonna get kicked out so uh, there is some some element of that roguelike permadeath gameplay to it uh, realistically you're not gonna run into that unless you're unless you're doing something weird or wrong uh, or both but it's it's still uh it still captures i'd say that roguelike feel of making your character into some kind of unique and cool build each time you play it and one thing i think that torgas does particularly well is that it doesn't look like you're going to be too required to go in there every week like you were with horrific visions horrific visions i'd say started out pretty high up here and seven months into the expansion they're pretty far down here into the ah dude why tier uh torgas so so right the horrific vision progression was it, you know, at the at the start of 8.3, Heroic Visions were up here, and then they kind of took a big old dive down here over time. I think Torghast is more likely going to end up, like, here at the start, and maybe fall down to here as the expansion goes on. I, I You know, I, I think you're going to get a little bit less excited about doing it, but one big nice thing about it is that you're not going to need to do it every single week. Like, you, the reason to do more Torghast is to unlock more Legendaries, uh, and unless you want all your legendaries, in which case you can do Torghast over and over again, but because you get to pick which legendary you want, there are going to be a bunch that are garbage that you don't need to worry about getting, uh, or some for like PvP or M+, and unless you want to do those forms of content, you don't have to, right? So you have a huge amount of choice there in agency. So Torghast, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that squiggly line thing. We'll say it starts out up here, and then it goes down here. This is going to be really confusing for anybody who just looks at the image at the end. They're going to be like, what is this line doing? I'm going to use this line for a couple more of the, the features to come in the future, though. So uh, each of them is going to mean something different. That's the thing about a great visualization is you want just to have no idea what it means without hearing a 30-minute video explaining it. All right. So up next, we've got uh, class changes. Class changes. Every time there's a new expansion, there's always kind of this, my class is going to feel so bad because... One thing we always get is, you know, you run out of, all your haste turns to zero, all your stat, all your secondaries go down to zero at the start of a new expansion. As you level up, your character just starts to feel much clunkier. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's important for each new expansion to hit that kind of reset button because otherwise, you know, we would just be running around like hyper speed 
uh, 500% haste after an expansion or two of not doing that reset. Uh, so I think that makes sense. It's, it is unfortunate. It's going to feel bad. Uh, on, at the start, you know, we're going to lose our corruption in the pre-patch, actually, which I think is smart for them to do that rather than when the expansion, rather than when you're leveling, make us lose the corruption early so that we have that negative feeling but don't associate it with Shadowlands directly. Um, the class design in general, I think, is good. I think that classes are... The base of classes is broadly better than it was in BFA. And one nice thing about 9.0 compared to 8.0 is I think there are more end game systems already in Shadowlands to layer on top of your character than there were in 8.0. In 8.0, we had like bad Azerite that had a lot of systems, a lot of Azerite improvements still needed to come. And you only got a single ring, a single outer ring of Azerite. Uh, so our characters felt pretty bare bones in 8.0, right? We, they felt pretty bad for quite a long time. In Shadowlands, we're already going to have like covenant abilities, conduits, legendaries, uh, these sorts of things already in effect in 9.0. So even though, yeah, our character is going to be stripped of all the expansion systems from BFA, we're going to have more in 9.0 than we did in 8.0. And I think it'll be enough that the characters will feel complete uh, earlier than they did in BFA. So all in all, I think that the new class design stuff is pretty good. New class stuff up here. Pretty cool. All right, we've got legendaries up next. Legendaries are acquired from doing Torghast, and everything that was great about Legion legendaries is here in Shadowlands. They're a little bit less powerful, I'd say, on average than the most powerful Legion legendaries, but I think that's a good thing. There, there was <laughs> some serious power level discrepancies between the best and the worst Legion legendaries. Uh, in Shadowlands... It's like Legion Legendaries, except there's no randomness associated with when you get your Legendary. Your Legendary is earned in a predictable way by doing Torghast, uh, according to a schedule that you can set for yourself. Uh, and there's some time getting associated with how quickly you can get infinite Legendaries, but we're going to have Legendaries very early in this expansion. Uh, you're, you'll have your first pick Legendary, and then uh, instead of getting a random effect, you get to choose which effect you want on le your Legendary and which stats you want on that item. Uh, and you get to put both of those, put all those things together and create your item. Most legendary effects have multiple different slots that they can be applied to. Not any different slot. You can't just put like every legendary in the game on a pair of boots. But for any given legendary effect, it'll be like this can go on a necklace or on boots. This can go on a glove or a ring or a chest piece. And you'll get to make that decision. Here's a little hint for free. Pick the, uh, the slot with the highest budgeting of stats because legendaries are high item level. And you want that, so like if you can put it on a chest piece, do that. That's going to be the strat. Um, but that's just, that's just some free advice there for you. All in all, I think this is just in the best the best parts of Legion Legendaries, and then taking the things that were drawbacks about Legion Legendaries and turning them into upsides instead, right? Instead of random stuff and bad stats for me for you maybe on a good legendary effect, you just get to pick everything about your legendary. Huge amount of uh, of player agency. I'm going to put them. This is going to be the highest up one, I think. Put it way up here. That's where legendaries are going to go. All right. Up next, wow, you'll notice there's a lot of stuff up here in the green section. Up next, we're going to do the covenant pick from a story perspective. So when you level up through Shadowlands, you do these four zones in a preset order on your first guy, and you meet up with each of the covenants in each of the zones, and they give you their power to help them fight the zone back. You fight the zone back. You know, you, you do cool stuff for them. You become very important to their survival in the Shadowlands, and then you move on. They, they send you to go and help their allies in a different zone, and so you go help the allies in the different zone. That zone's co covenant helps you out. They give you a power, and, you know, your ability to walk between all these zones and walk into the Maw uh, is, you know, mystifying to these different covenants, and they're all really excited about it, and they're all allies together uh, in this war in the Shadowlands, uh, for, for the Shadowlands, and so that, you know, it's a really fun leveling experience. Uh, you got all these different cool abilities, and then level 60 hits, and you have to pick. You have to pick one of these covenants, or else you are... Yeah, I mean, that's it. You have to pick one. You can't really delay the choice either. You are, you know, you can't just wait to see what they nerf. You have to basically pick one on your leveling progression, or start falling behind on... And it'll be annoying to catch up. Not impossible to catch up, like previous systems they've made, but annoying. Like, it'll just be a little bit, a little bit more grind to do so. Um, so, in terms of storyline, it's very disjointing to go through this storyline experience of all these covenants being allies, and then you get to max level and you're like, okay, because, because you're helping the Night Fae, who we sent you to help, you're no longer welcome here in the Kyrian Covenant. You know, we're, how, how could you do this to us? Uh, there's, it's, it's super weird that the quests are like that. At the end of the day, for me, the covenant pick storyline-wise, it's not a big deal. Uh, covenant pick storyline-wise. It, it, it's, it's like, it's weird. 
but it's not the end of the world. I don't, I don't care too much about the storyline. I imagine if you're a lore expert, you'll find this more disjointing. If you're somebody who likes to have your character make sense in the world, it's going to be really weird to have these quests where they send you to go help their allies and then they get mad at you for helping their allies. Um, but that, that is what it is. The other part of the Covenant pick is that it comes with huge amounts of power for your character. And I did a long video about this. I don't want to rehash this too much. Uh, but basically, you're going to pick one of these covenants for you, and it's going to lock you in. And different covenants are good for different specs. They're good for different forms of content, like Mythic Plus, Raid, and PvP, Fire, Frost, and Arcane. Depending on which class you pick, you may have a completely different answer for multiple of these different things, right? You might have a different BIS covenant for raiding on your main spec, raiding on your off spec, M plus on your main spec and M plus on your off spec or PVP on your main spec as well, right? You might have actually four different BIS covenants for that, that kind of content. And the difference between these abilities is quite large, right? It's not the kind of thing where you're not going to notice it. You are absolutely going to notice not having access to these covenants. And my evidence for this is how much uh, on beta, it was really important that we got back the ability to swap for testing. For a brief period of time on beta, we couldn't swap our covenants. Uh, when they made it so that it was a leveling server and there was no endgame server. And that was a really big problem for testing. And then for raid testing, once we got back the ability to pick covenants, every single day that we've done raid testing, I have swapped my covenants to try out different stuff for different fights. That's one of my favorite things about World of Warcraft is trying out different stuff for different fights and seeing what's going to be good. In the actual version of Shadowlands, that's not going to be an option at all. If you see somebody doing something cool on your class, on your spec, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to replicate it or even to try it, even to try it out a little bit, because you just can't swap your covenant at all. It's it's locked. Um, you can, we, we still don't know the exact process of this. You can swap it on a kind of one-way basis. You can change your covenant, but swapping back to a covenant you've already played before is going to be more expensive, they've said. We still don't know the exact systems behind this, or if we do, I've missed it. Um, but either way, the, the main problem is that, you know, if, if I want to play a different covenant for a fight or for a dungeon... Uh, and try out something cool, try out some cool ability that I've seen somebody else do that I think might be cool. Even if I want to do that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay most costs they could set to discourage people from switching covenants are going to work, right? They're, they're going to cause me to not want to swap there. For me, this covenant pick is down here in the ah dude Y tier. This is, this is, it's, it's, it's really rough. I could see this being, here's one thing, right? Like it depends a little bit on which spec you're playing. I'm thinking about playing uh, Blood Decay in Shadowlands. Uh, right now, I'm thinking about Blood Decay or maybe Vengeance DH, because I'm going to be main tanking for my raid. It actually looks like for Blood Decay, there's a good chance this isn't going to affect me too much. It looks like for Blood Decay in particular, I might be living up here in the, like, in the, I guess I'll live with it tier, because it looks like Night Fae might just be my best for everything. And for Frost and Unholy, I might be, I might be able to get away with Night Fae and have it not be a problem at all. For Vengeance DH, doesn't look like that will be as much the case. And for a lot of the other specs, it doesn't look like that's going to be as much the case. Uh, but there's a huge, there's a bit of randomness to this, right? You might just get lucky and be playing a class where you actually have good covenant options for all the forms of content you want to do that's all, all the same covenant. Um, but if you don't, I feel like it's going to be down here. Uh, so a little bit of randomness here. This could, it could be anywhere up to here. So covenants, if you're lucky, we'll put, we'll put covenants if you're lucky up here. Covenants, if you're lucky. Okay. Um, conduit locking is a subset of covenant issues. Your co conduits are, so you have, in addition to your covenant, each covenant comes with three soulbind trees that you can swap between as much as you want, whenever you want. And they're basically like su super talent trees, kind of. And into each of these trees, there's some abilities that are specific to that tree. Uh, so the these soulbinds are like flavored after somebody in that conduit, and you become super good friends with them. And you start uh, unlocking the ability to access their soulbinds, and they'll, there'll be abilities in there that are powerful and thematic to that person, to that soul. And there are also empty slots where you can put in conduits. And conduits are basically Azerite traits or artifact traits or whatever. You know, they're like, oh, you know, your this spell has a reduced cooldown. Your this spell does X percent more damage or whatever. And you'll slot those into your, your soulbind tree, and that will empower your spec for that soulbind. But you cannot swap these conduits except for once per week. Every time you swap your conduits, you incur a one-week cooldown before you can do it again. You, you have to wait until the next week to be reset, I should say, actually, rather. Um, so... This means that if you are somebody who wants to play two different specs, you might get lucky and you might have different good soulbind trees for your covenant, for your specs, for the kind of content you're doing, or you might not. You might really want to play the same uh, soulbind tree. Some of the soulbinds are really impactful uh, and bring things like immunity to certain effects. 
uh, that might be important for whatever kind of content you're doing. And so if you've slotted your frost conduits into that soulbind tree and you want to play fire, you want to try out fire, you can do that once per week. It's a really restrictive amount of time to be able to do that swap and you can never swap back in the same week, right? Like if you want to try fire for a bit, you are giving up on the opportunity to go back to frost for the entire week. Uh, to me, the conduit locking, hope th this feels like the covenant system seems like something that they're pretty hard set on at this point. Uh, the conduit locking, I think there might still be time for them to change this one one week thing. Uh, and it r right now, as it stands, it's in the ah dude y tier. Conduit locking. It, it, it's like, th this may not affect you, but if it does, whenever it does, it's going to be awful. It's going to be similar to the Azerite reforging in that like most of the time you can kind of ignore it. But whenever it does come up that it's a problem, whenever it does come up that you're looking at like an, an impossible to pay Azerite reforge or that one weekly lockout, you're just going to be like, Ah, dude, why? And that's why this tier is the Ah, dude, why tier. All right. Uh, then finally, last but not least, people are going to be thinking, oh, what? How, how did he omit this? But I've saved the worst for last. This is the AoE cap. The AoE cap is coming in, and it, it is going to mean that a lot of specs will be unable to deal effective damage beyond five targets or six targets. Um, there's an article on Wowhead that will that posts lists exactly which specs are getting AoE capped. It's largely melee specs, uh, but there are a couple range specs in there as well that are getting capped. Uh, and this, to me, when I first made my video about the AoE cap, there was a lot of people that were like, oh, this is going to be fine because they are going to design fights and dungeons such that it doesn't matter if you're AoE capped. That's false. Uh, there's raid fights that are hugely, you're hugely hurt by being AoE capped on. And there's dungeons where not just combining pulls, but even just doing the dungeon one pull at a time, you're going to run into this AoE cap heavily. So that's not going to be the case. And like I said at the time, it's really hard to design an MMO where you never want to fight more than five targets at once. Um, second of all, the other thing that people said is, oh, it's going to be fine because they will make the specs that are AoE capped better on small AoE such that it, it pays off for them not being good at big AoE. That's also not true for obvious reasons again. The obvious reasons here are that if a class is good at less than five targets and another class is good at more than five targets, it's a really apparent issue when that spec is, is really good at like, if there's a disp discrepancy between how good specs are at single target, that is something that gets fixed instantly, right? That's some that's something where they actively try to make sure that everything is balanced around that. So if you balance everything around single target, and then specs, you know, fall off into AoE, and then some specs fall all the way off at 5 and some specs don't, you, you don't actually have a tuning knob of adjusting where they start on single or on two target or whatever, because you're locked into needing to balance around that, right? Nobody is okay with a... a a World of Warcraft where specs have 10% or more difference in their patchwork sims, right? That is, that's really, that's something that Blizzard actively tries to fix as much as they can. So because of that restriction, the AoE cap is purely a downside. If you're AoE capped, it's not like you have a strength and compared to other specs, you just have a weakness compared to them. Uh, this is something that whether or not this affects you, again, it's going to depend on whether you pick an AoE, AoE capped class. Um, my suspicion is that this is going to make Shadowlands more restrictive for high end M plus than BFA was. And BFA was somewhat restrictive. It wasn't that bad, particularly towards the end. But, you know, if you weren't playing a meta spec and you were trying to get into 25 keys or into 20 keys, it could be pretty challenging. Uh, and if you're trying to do higher than 25, it was largely impossible for a lot of the specs. Um, in Shadowlands, I feel like the AoE capped classes are going to be, there's going to be a huge bar that is set at whatever, like a Mythic plus 10, right? Mythic plus 10, everybody's going to be able to do that. Every spec's going to be able to do that because you need to be able to do that to get your best rewards each week. And if people feel like they can't do that at all, there's going to be a huge uproar and that'll get fixed. Mythic plus 11, when you start getting to that level of like, I would like to push a key, you know, I'd like to do mythic plus for fun at, at a high level. I believe that that option is not going to exist in a serious fashion for the AOE capped specs. So uh, I, I, think that, I think that that's what Shadowlands is going to look like. I would love to be wrong about this. I, I hope I'm wrong about everything that I have down here in the red section. But I believe if your goal is to push Mythic Plus or to just do a weekly plus 10 and not be doing half as much damage as the person who picked a better spec than you, uh, the AoE cap is, is going to be the culprit there. So this one is also going in the Ah Dude Y tier. All right, that is uh, my synopsis of the different effects of different things in Shadowlands. A lot of really cool stuff up here, a lot of great stuff. I haven't spent as much time making videos or talking about these great things because they're good already, right? There's, they don't need feedback on this stuff. They've already, they've already knocked a lot of these things out of the park. Uh, but all in all, there's a lot of great effects about Shadowlands. How good the expansion is going to be, 
I don't know, if they can bring one, two, or if they manage to bring all three of these things up out of the Ah Dude Y tier, Shadowlands will be the best expansion of all time. If not, if all three of these things stay unchanged, it could still be a pretty good expansion. I, I, I'm worried. I'm worried about these three really holding back the what would otherwise be a great expansion. Um, I'm hopeful that this one, the Conduit Locking... Conduit locking is something they could fix at any time, basically, and make better, and it wouldn't really compromise their values, I don't think. So that's the one I'm most hopeful they'll fix. The AoE cap, time is kind of running out on this being reasonably fixed. Uh, th this one is one that, like, there's a lot of balancing that'll probably need to be, they'll probably need to look at before they would revert this change on a big level. And that's something that probably needs to happen before the launch happens. So we've kind of maybe got another month where we could still see this happen once pre-patch hits the servers. That's pro it's probably the end for this being fixed before 8 point or before 9.1. Uh, or realistically, probably before 10.0. And the Covenant pick, it looks like this is going to make it into 9.0. It looks like the Covenants are going to make it into 9.0 in the state that they're in right now. Um, the question for me is, A, I might be wrong. Covenants might be fine. In which case, great. We don't need any further action. I don't think that's particularly likely, but uh, it's definitely a possibility, of course. Gotta, gotta recognize that. The other option is, it does get fixed, but eventually. In which case, it gets fixed in 9.1. The expansion will probably still be great. Uh, 9.1 is soon enough that this won't hold back the expansion too much. It gets fixed in 9.2 or 9.3, then uh, I think we're looking at a little bit, a little bit more of a, an expansion. Not necessarily a bad expansion, but one of those expansions where you're looking and you're like, "What a shame!" You know, it, it could have been so great, uh, and instead it was okay or or pretty good, right? Uh, and then of course there's a possibility that it just doesn't get fixed the whole expansion. This would be something like the GCD issues that have kind of plagued the game since uh, since 8.0 for a lot of specs. Uh, specs like Guardian Druid, Protection Paladin have really just felt clunky the entirety of BFA. Uh, and this may, it may be that there are 20 or so specs that feel bad in the entirety of Shadowlands because of their Covenant situation, and 16 or so specs that get lucky and don't run into those issues at all and get to play in both Raid and Mythic Plus without feeling weighed down and get to play their off specs without feeling weighed down. I don't exactly know what those numbers are going to end up being, but I feel like it's going to be somewhere around that kind of half and half range. Um, I'll maybe make some videos for people that are interested in picking specs that do well on the Covenant pick and the AoE cap criteria if you want to avoid these ah dude why moments. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try and make some videos there to help you out. Although I do worry a little bit that if I make a video telling you which specs are AoE capped and which specs aren't, I am going to be the person that people talk about as being the reason why their AoE cap specs can't get into their weekly key in LFG. So... I'm a little bit hesitant to make that video for that reason. But anyways, uh, this video has dragged on for too long. I'm getting out of here. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know if you think there's something I should have included in this video but didn't. Uh, and let me know if you think that there's any of these, anything that I've misrated on this list. Uh, and also let me know all of your criticisms of Microsoft Paint, the greatest system or the greatest application of all time. I've been Dratnos. Check out my Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash Dratnos. Remember to subscribe and like and stuff. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.